Ohio, several Free Will Baptists will be there Sunday school and the preaching hour. And tonight we'll be preaching and uh, business starts uh, tomorrow. And uh, when you pray, pray that our denomination will stay true to the Word of God. We hear every year of another denomination going by the wayside. And I just hope and pray that when Wednesday at lunchtime comes, that uh, they'll walk out of there uh, stronger than ever for the Word of God. I uh, read some uh, last night communication from Cincinnati and uh, looked at some pictures of people that I went to school with and Teddy and I were together I think last Friday a while and I thought I was the only one did this but I did it last night I looked at pictures of people that I went to school with that's in Cincinnati now They've been there since last Wednesday setting up booths. And they'll leave there next Thursday morning, if not next Wednesday. And I was thinking to myself, do I look that old? <laughs> and uh, we, well, yeah, I guess we all do that every once in a while. But... Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad to see some folks that some 50 years ago uh, I met and were at the National together and they're still there. I guess they're looking around wondering where I'm at. But if it ever goes back to Charleston, West Virginia or North Carolina, if I'm a hundred and I can make it, I'm going to go. Uh, best memories I've got. Uh, they know how to worship. I told somebody it started at 7 o'clock and the service was still going at 10.30 in West Virginia. And they would empty the altar and it'd fill right back up again. Mm -hmm. You're talking about revival service. That was good. Reminds me of uh, what Glenn Poston said last night. He said this uh, preacher come in getting ready, prepared to preach. Uh, gets up behind the pulpit to preach and he notices up in the balcony his seven-year-old boy He's got a pea shooter. <laughs> but he's looking at him and he's thinking, well, he may be not going to shoot that thing. And he said every once in a while he'd hear somebody say, oh, ouch, or something. And he figured out then what was going on. And he was just fixing to, in a rough voice, get his son's attention to tell him to quit that and just before he could say that his son yelled back dad you keep preaching and I'll keep him away <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I thought that was pretty good but and it's probably true I don't know up in the mountains no telling what to go on Turn with me, if you will, to Luke's Gospel. And I'm going to preach this morning on the cup. Preach on the cup. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 53 that I've read before, but we're going to do this a little different. Luke 22. Thank <laughs> you. 
and I'll be better than me as I am. It look, it's pages are sticking together. Luke 22, verse 39. One more page for me. <clears throat> Think about the cup. The Bible says, Luke 22, 39. And he came out and went as it was one to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. <laughs> and when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them a battle stone's cast. And kneeled down and he prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup. What do you think was in that cup? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you this morning, we're talking about the same cup, but what he had and what we had in that cup is extremely different. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it was great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. If the Lord come today, my prediction is he would find the church asleep. I mean spiritually. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest the Son of Man with a kiss? He knew what was in Judas' heart then. Remember when he said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? And so Judas was going to kiss him. In verse 49, When they were, which were about him saw that he would follow, they said unto him, Lord, Shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye this far. And he touched his ear and he healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priest and to the captain of the temple and to the elders which were come to him, But ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves, at swords and sticks. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stood <coughs> forth no hand against me, but this is your hour 
and the power of darkness. We're living in the hour and power of darkness. Evidently, people are blind to what's going on in this world. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have behind this sacred desk. We thank you that we can read your word. We can see it unfolding in front of us. And I pray that you will bless us today in this service. As printed on the front of the table, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me, what I've done for you. Lord, help us never to forget how much you love us and what you've done for us. And help us to be faithful to you call us home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the introduction, I'm not going to take long because I want to get to the message, but I want you to think with me. Jesus spent the last evening of his life with his disciples. Probably the closest people on earth to him. Somebody, or several somebody's told me before I ever left Solano, North Carolina, won't do you any good to go to school to be a preacher. God has to call you. You can't learn anything in school. Well, I, I've heard some good preachers that have never been to school, but... I think it's like sharpening an axe. You might have an axe and be a good wood chopper, but unless you've got something to sharpen that axe with, it'll soon get dull. I see uh, in the Word of God where Jesus spent his last day with the disciples celebrating the Passover and preparing for the coming events. He planted the seed of confidence in them. And I'll not take time to read all these scriptures, but I'll tell you where they're off. He tried his best to plant the seed of confidence in them. What I say will happen in John 14. He promised an unusual life in John 15. He encouraged them to live a positive life in John 16. He prayed for them. And I've said this over and over. What's the Lord's Prayer? John chapter 17. You read it. That whole chapter is Him praying for us. And then we see in Luke 22. Jesus is in the garden preparing himself for the hour just ahead. He dropped people here and here and here and he went further into the garden. And I read to you where his sweat became as great drops of blood. He came into that garden to talk to his father. And he wanted to talk to his father alone, so he told the disciples, you sit here, and you sit here, and you stay here, and you pray. You know the story. You see it several times through the Bible where Jesus comes out, and what does he find? He finds them asleep. And he says, what? Could you not pray with me for just one hour? We have people that might pray 10 minutes, and if they do, somebody's going to fuss about it. When prayer is very important. And he said, pray that you won't be tempted. And if you don't pray, you'll be tempted even more. And he tells us the most important opportunity in our lives is available as a result of us praying and Jesus
Jesus talking to his father. How did he talk to him? Through prayer. And you can read the scriptures, Luke, well I did, the verses that I just read to you. We can look at the events in the garden, but we'll not take time today. Jesus' agony of his soul, his earnest prayer, and he prayed the most earnest prayer he ever prayed by himself. He died by himself. People left him. Not counting the ones hanging on the cross that could not leave. The betrayal of the intimate friends that he had in verse 47 of Luke 22. The confirmation of the commitment is found in verse 42. What is this cup? This is the focal point of the message today. What's in the cup? Think about it. The cup contains, and I'm going to go back over this in a minute. The cup contains forgiveness for every sin that we've ever committed. Jesus demonstrated his desire to forgive sin while he was on the cross. Preacher, how did he do that? When he was ridiculed and spit on and his beard pulled out and nailed to the cross and they lifted it up and dropped it in the socket of the rock and the flesh tore. The other two already there. And Jesus said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And He gave everybody an opportunity that day, that hour, to accept Him as a Savior and He's hanging on a cross. One person, a thief, maybe a murderer, called him Lord. And he said, Lord, remember me this day when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, this day you will be with me in paradise. Do you remember the day that you asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, remember me and forgive me of my sin? And come into my heart and save me and take me to heaven when I die. I believe the Bible and if you prayed that prayer sincerely, Jesus heard it and wrote your name in the book of life. Did that make you perfect? No. There's still none of us perfect. We still wrestle with the flesh every day because Satan is as real as Jesus is. But it helps us to draw closer to the Lord Jesus. The promise of John 1, or 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, grew out of the events that happened on the cross. And you know those scriptures without me even saying it. Paul referred to the cross in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And I've quoted that verse millions of times. And we know because of the cross that this cup contains freedom from the dominion of sin. Paul speaks of this cup in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 and verse 22. 
There is a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of what was happening in Jeremiah 52, verses 33-34. The cup gives us a future in the presence of the Father in John chapter 14. Jesus talks about our future with Him. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare that place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said that in preparing that place even today. I love that song, If Jesus Comes Tomorrow, What Then? Could you lay down what you're doing and reach out and take His hand? Or would you have to turn away and sigh and walk away? When Jesus took our sins upon Himself, the Father turned away. <coughs> I believe everybody here today has probably been disappointed in some people that they thought were their friends. Probably you have had friends and right when you needed them, they didn't show. Well, I thought they'd be here. I guess if there was disappointment, Jesus certainly had it. Because the Bible teaches us that when Jesus took our sins upon Himself, His Father even turned away from Him because He could not look upon sin. And Jesus had my sin and yours and the whole world. Jesus died alone because it was the only way to solve the sin problem. I don't care how much money you've got. I don't care how much prestige you have. I don't care how much uh, money. I don't care how much property. I don't care what you own here. That could not be sold and get you to heaven. Only the blood of Jesus can wash away our sins. And due to Him being the only way that we can get to heaven, it tells us in Romans 5, 8, but God commended His love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And because of the cross, we can sing now that great hymn there is a fountain. And this is your part. There is a fountain. Now I want you to stand with us. And I want you to sing it from your heart like you mean it. Because it really happens.
in your mind, you may be seated, and think about what happened that day. Every demon in hell tried to stop Jesus from being born. Every demon in hell tried to stop Jesus when he was two years old. And Herod heard where he was at. And there was great lament. There was mothers weeping. Because babies were literally being torn from their mother's arms that were two years old and down and killed trying to get rid of Jesus. Folks, Satan will never get rid of Jesus. He'll never get rid of the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. They will be a remnant when Jesus comes. I've said last week, and I'm not ready to preach it yet, but to whet your appetite, the rapture and the second coming are two different things. And people have got them mixed up, and there's a lot of difference. You see, when the Bible talks about being raptured, and that word, by the way, is not in your Bible. Uh, you won't find it in a King James Version Bible. But you will find words like caught up, which means the same thing. And so it tells us that before the end comes, that we will be caught up to meet the Lord where? In the sky. In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't have time to get off on that right now, but I want you to know that it, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus is not coming to earth then. We're leaving. But He will be back. And His name's not Swartz now. And when he comes back, his foot will set on the Mount of Olives and it will split wide open. And there'll be a big change. There'll be a big change the first time. It reminds me of something I think Teddy told me Friday. We talked a lot and I try to listen. <laughs> I can't hear good and I want to hear so much. I want to learn so much. But talking about somebody that needed to get on a plane and fly, he said, no, I don't want to do that. But you got to. You got to get on here and you got to fly with it. No, I don't want to. And he said, well, you claim to be a Christian and you claim to know the Lord, and why do you? Why are you afraid to get on a plane and fly? He said, uh, "The Lord could call you any time." He said, "I'm ready to go," and he said, "Well, why don't you get on the plane then?" He said, I ain't worried about the Lord calling me when we get up there. I'm worried about uh, Him not calling you. And then the whole plane going down. I'm probably mess that up. But if you want to know the rest of it, that's Teddy. <laughs> but anyway, I want you to see what the blood had for us was good things. He planted the seed. The cup contained forgiveness of sin. The cup demonstrated his desire to forgive us like he forgave the thief on the cross. The cup 
John chapter, 1 John 1, 9 grew out of that very event on the cross. Romans 5, 8 grew out of that event on the cross. I believe that song we just sung grew out of that event on the cross. I'm going to ask the blessing on the bread. And when I do, uh, just make your way down and get the bread. And then we'll do the same thing with the cup. Father, we thank you that you gave us all that heaven had. The best that heaven had. We did not deserve to be here today. But Lord, you forgave us. There had to be bloodshed, so you shed yours. Your book tells us that greater love hath no man than this. And he laid down his life for his friend. And in the pages of this book, you said, I don't call you servant, I call you friend. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. And I pray that you will bless the bread as representing your body in Jesus' name. Jesus said, you take the bread and break it and eat it and remember, this is my body that was broken for you. Let's eat together. He said, when you pour the cup, this cup is to represent my blood shed for the remission of sin. So as we take the cup, let's hold it till we can drink together. That's it. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Father, Lord, thank you for this day of forgiveness. An ultimate sacrifice you saved for us and for shedding your blood to cover our sins. Lord, may we always remember that on the foot of Calvary there's an even, even ground that anybody can come to you, no matter skin, race, whatever it may be, that your blood's for all. We love you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me and my shed blood on Calvary for the remission of your sin. Let's drink together. Bible says, supper being ended, that the disciples sang a song and went out. And ever since I heard that a long time ago, I've always did it the way the Bible says. So we're ready. Thank you. 